Welcome to University Drive, your pathway to the transformational work of University of the Bahamas. Our goal is to build a better Bahamas by shaping tomorrow's leaders today, finding solutions to challenges and forging new opportunities for growth. University Drive, where faculty, staff, students and alumni travel the road of progress together with you. A year of Bahamian theater in honor of the 50th anniversary of Bahamian independence. What does it all mean for the Bahamas, for the Bahamian consciousness, and what can and should we look forward to for the next 50 years and beyond in Bahamian theater? Let's talk about it. I'm Tamika Lundy, and this is University Drive. Joining us as guests are Dr. Craig Smith and Dr. Nicolette Bethel, faculty at UB, but also very much leaders in the performing arts and theater specifically, whose passion and drive for its sustainability are well known. We also have joining us Dominic Stubbs, who is a UB student, a law and criminal justice major, but he's also one of the characters in the uh, still standing production written by Michael Pintard, a collection of poems, and which is being directed by Craig Smith. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tamika. Thank you, Tamika. Good to be here again. So this is our, our first show uh, for 2023. I'm trusting and hoping that the year is, th is treating all of you well. The year started off with a great big bang for me and Craig in particular. Well, <laughs> even a bigger bang for Craig because he mm -hmm. had two things. We had, we hosted the Shakespeare Theater Association conference in Nassau from January 1st through 8th. And Craig organized an extremely, I don't even want to say well-received, um, transformational day at the University of the Bahamas. School of English, Blue Flamingo Literary Festival, Shakespeare in Paradise hosted a symposium on decolonizing Shakespeare here at the university, which was revolutionary for the people who attended SCA and Craig was behind that at the same time as he was rehearsing and getting ready to open Still Standing. So he needs a hand. We give all of you a hand. That that, that is certainly extraordinary. And, and, and thank you um, all. Thank you to, to the three of you for being so actively engaged in helping us to do some things that I think that we need to do, right? So let's let's talk about the performing arts and let's talk about Bahamian theater. When you think about theater in the Bahamas, Nicolette, I'll start with you. Does it give you a good feeling in terms of support, engagement, knowledge, and how Bahamians view it in terms of whether they in view it as something that is important and vital, um, especially when we think about the Bahamian identity. And I know that may be a loaded question. It's very loaded and it's and you won't get me in trouble straight <laughs> off the top. So let me just dive right in and get myself in trouble. Two sides of this. First of all, Bahamian theater as a discipline is extremely robust and very strong. And that is why we decided to do a year of Bahamian theater. The hallmarks of this year of Bahamian theater is that we selected 13 plays, each one by a different Bahamian author from across the 50 years of the independence period, um, because those, that, those 50 years coincide with the growth explosion of Bahamian theater. The fact that many, if not most Bahamians are not aware of the strength and the quality of Bahamian theater is an indictment on us all, but let's particularly say the powers that be, because these are the kinds of things that we should all be studying in school, celebrating, supporting, financing, putting out there. This is one of the best kept secrets of our country. And yes, I have a little bias, but I don't think that I'm wrong. Um, and Bahamian theater of all the literary arts, Craig as a literary professor can, can adjust this or correct me, but is our strongest literary art with the possible exception of poetry. And 
in still standing, you're going to get both of them coming together. Um, yes. Um, I agree with Nico that I think that there is a very vibrant theater community amongst the theater people. You know, I think that um, we could definitely use um, some help in exposing what we do and what we have done. And I think that's why this is important, what we're doing here with the Year of Bahamian Theater. Uh, oftentimes, our with Shakespeare, anyway, we only think of the out of those who know about Shakespeare and Paradise only think about Bahamian theater maybe in October, right? And um, but you know we have theater in different theater companies throughout um, Nassau, Grand Bahama has a vibrant theater community as well, and I think that you know in certain ways we just need to a, a bit more exposure and a lot more support from the general public. But in terms of um, actors, in terms of Bahamian directors, in terms of Bahamian playwrights, those are all booming. Um, and a lot of that is thanks to the work that Shakespeare in Paradise has been doing um, in particular, and I talk about this all the time, Nico came up with the short tales um, project several years ago um, to encourage the development of the theater in the Bahamas. And so if you don't know about Short Tales, what it does, there's a call that goes out for original plays written by Bahamians that goes out every year. And later on in the year, the top 10 are chosen. And these are usually one act plays, um, 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and those are performed during Shakespeare in Paradise. And so not only though, do we have um, different um, people writing these plays, there's also a call for people who are interested in learning how to direct. So they get a chance to direct a play. And then of course, with the proliferation of all these plays, that means that there are more opportunities for actors. And so people who've been interested in acting can come out and, you know, and so in that way, and every year we've had great turnouts um, in terms of directors, writers, and actors, and stagehands, people behind the scenes as well. So there is a thirst and a desire uh, for the theater product in the Bahamas amongst our students, but also amongst other people as well who are in the work field, but who want an artistic outlet. And they come out and they're a part of um, these activities as well. So I am optimistic in terms of thinking about theater and the growth um, where I may not be, well, maybe where I need to be a bit more optimistic is in terms of thinking about the support or where I would like to see more support um, for it from industry, from the Bahamian public in general and from the government. Great. I, I like the pipeline strategy that you mentioned there a moment ago. I, I like that. And, and Dominic, the question from me is a little different for you. What attracted you to acting and particularly in theater? Let us let us in. Uh, good day. Well, what really got me into acting was Shakespeare in Paradise. Um, me and my mother, we would sit home and I'd turn on cable 12 during the midday and I'd see a I'd see Shakespeare and Paradise reruns going on and I'd ask her questions like, mommy, you know these people? Oh, mommy, this looks so cool. And since I was very young, I always wanted to get into acting. And it, it wasn't until I really got into high school is when I, I really found my love for it and then reignited it with Short Tales in 2022 and Still Standing with Michael Pintar. But there, as to play off, to what Professor Smith had said, there is a desire and there is a need for Bahamian theater. And especially at the University of the Bahamas, I personally know loads of people who are interested in not only acting, but directing, screenwriting, and even just helping out backstage. And so the way I got into it was through UB and through the UB Theater Company. And they sent out a message 
um, asking for young men to be a part of Professor um, Craig Smith's play and telling Shakespeare, Greater Boy Julian. And so I I filled I filled in the, the call and the rest is history, I should say. <laughs> wow. So Nicolette, how satisfying and encouraging is that to hear Dominic talk about how what attracted him and it being, you know, through watching Shakespeare in Paradise. Um, it's all yeah. part of the plan. That was, that was, <laughs> that when we founded Shakespeare in Paradise in 2009, we wanted to create a festival that would do a number of different things. And I don't need to go into all of them because what Dominic is describing is exactly one of them. We wanted to introduce new audiences to Bahamian theater. We wanted to give people the opportunity for exposure, but also for performing, coming in and learning, because we don't have a performing arts school in this country. We do not have the support for the performing arts that pretty well any other country in this, in the world has, including our Caribbean neighbors. If you are interested in the performing arts in the Bahamas, it's a learn by doing kind of thing. It is, you, you can't study it in school. You can't study it in, in university. You can't study it at BD, BTVI. And there is no performing arts school certainly in New Providence that you can study with. There are, there are some strong performing arts teachers and communities in Grand Bahama, as Craig mentioned. But in Nassau, you just cannot get the training. You have, to, you have to train yourself. You have to get your own exposure or become an apprentice. And that is the idea that we're trying to put out there with Shakespeare in Paradise. We want to provide people with an apprenticeship program so that they can learn the skills because ain't nobody else making any opportunity for us to do that any other way. Um, yeah, so so what Dominic is saying is is a success for us because that was part of the plan, as I say. I, I, I hear you on I hear you on that. I absolutely hear you. And it's 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 interesting you should say that in terms of there not being a school for the performing arts, a centralized focus for that to happen. And uh, you know, the Prime Minister just mentioned recently at Bahamas Business Outlook, you know, the the need for such a vehicle, such a thing. Um, but you know, I think as we move into observing the road to 50 and marking the 50th year, I think that perhaps we just need to be a little bit more intentional about making some things happen. Um, and, and to segue from there is what happens in Bahamian theater. Is that a reflection of who we are? Is, is it a reflection of our culture or is it a producer of our culture? It's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? So how do you view that? Yeah, I think it's both. Um, so I'm gonna, since, you know, since we founded Shakespeare in Paradise, let me quote Shakespeare for a moment. Um, we, theater holds a mirror up to nature. So we are reflecting back to Bahamians what Bahamian writers see in the society. And if people follow our year of Bahamian theater, they will learn a lot about our country without really even feeling it, right? Because these plays are, they cover every decade of our independence period from 1973 through to 2022. Um, and they are a reflection of who we are. But also to make, I'm re it's a really interesting thought that you put forward. Theater does, it's also a creator of culture um, in some ways. Not in all ways, maybe not the way that we want to think about it necessarily, but it does also create and, and, and guide shifts in our cultural conversations. And that that this happens is, is what theater does. A lot of people have asked us about why don't we film what we do and put it on. And, and the answer is what well, we do because as Dominic said, he saw some, but that's not the point of what we do. Shakes, um, theater has a power that is different from many of the other performing arts and many of the other dramatic arts that we're familiar with, like film and television, because theater gathers a group of people together, the performers and the audience are all live in the same space at the same time. And ancient societies all around the world understood that this is a special moment. It, it is all 
it, there's this communal aspect, there's this participation, this dialogue between the performers and the audience, and that creates something that the ancient Greeks called catharsis, which is has been incorporated into modern psychotherapy. And it's not an accident that Freud, the father of modern psychotherapy, based a lot of his theories on ancient Greek theater. Because before psychotherapy, theater was a place where people went to get that theater, therapy, to be healed because of that communal aspect. Um, so theater both reflects and creates cultural realities, I think. I can I can endorse the sentiment you expressed about the power of theater because I just remember you took me back there while you were talking because I remember being in high in junior high school and and coming out to plays at the Dundas and one of them was the, um, the Legend of Sammy Swain and I I thoroughly enjoyed it and I, I I get it I get I get what you're saying and it 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 helped me to kind of think about culture more actively. Um, that was one of the, the the key impacts it made on me, at least way back then. And, you know, as I remember, I I, I cannot forget um, the setting up that play by, by James Kathleen. Um, and I believe that's the play where one of the songs they sing is, um, is that setting up song. And I just, you know, when I think about Bahamian Theater, that's one of the, the plays that I think about. Because we're doing it. Yeah. Exactly. I see. I see it on the list. Right. So how did you go about selecting the plays that I see on the list here? We have first first comes morning. Um, we have the landlord music um, of the Bahamas still standing. That's going on now. Woman take two. How did you select them? Well, part of it was that they are iconic, but part of it was we wanted to celebrate. Like I say, a lot of people are not aware of the depth and the strength of Bahamian theater and the Bahamian performing arts. A lot of people in the 21st century who are filmmakers and performers don't know the history, don't know the, the shoulders on which they stand, right? So we wanted to um, identify the what, who we consider the, the seminal um, writers. And there are more. That's the other thing that I wanted people to understand. We have 13 plays by 13, 14 different writers um, from across the independence period. And there are others that we didn't include. One of the things that I think is missing from our list, although I hope we can be forgiven because we're not from that place, uh, is the strong tradition of theater that they have in Grand Bahama, right? Um, and the Grand Bahamian contribution. We do have two Grand Bahamians represented, kind of, Michael Pintard, is one of those people who's back and forth. Like he started off in New Providence, but his main, most of his theatrical activity happened, I think, in Grand Bahama. And we also have Susan Wallace, who is a native Grand Bahamian and the grandmother of us all in terms of Bahamian theater. When I was in high school back in the early independence period, let's just put it like that, <laughs> um, Susan Wallace was the cornerstone of our literary studies when we started to look at Bahamian theater and, and Bahamian literature. And she did poems and stories and plays, and we all had to learn her, her poems and we were exposed to her plays. So we are celebrating Susan as well as all these other people. And the other people that we are right, we're, we're dealing with, we see them all as seminal writers in the Bahamian theatrical tradition. People like um, Sam Boodle, who is one of the founders of the University Players, one of the major um, theater groups back in the 60s and the 70s. People like Ian Strawn, who's in the next wave, the, the first set of COB graduates to make it big on stage, right? Um, we have P. Anthony White, who people may not even know as a playwright, but he was. He did many plays which have great titles, and we're, we're featuring him. We have Pat Ramming, again, somebody else that people may not realize was a playwright and an actor, but who was. Of course, we can't have a, a year without Winston Saunders or James Catlin. And then we have other writers like Jeannie Thompson and Telsine Turner, who was, I think, the first Bahamian writer to win an international award for this very play, Woman Take Two. So um, we just selected... We thought of the writers that we wanted to 
to feature first and then we selected the place. Got it. So still standing by Michael Pintard, COB grad, COB slash UB grad, well-known playwright, is now directed by Craig Smith. So what guided your thoughts in directing this? What's guiding your thoughts in your directorship of still standing Craig Smith? Um, pure madness, mostly, <laughs> but still standing as a collection of poems. So my task was then to figure out how we present this po this poetry in a theatrical way, given the limited time frame I had. Thanks, Nico. Um, <laughs> so... Um, so what I thought, I mean, immediately when it was about poetry, I thought of um, the Coria poem for colored girls who committed suicide when the rainbow is not enough, right? And so I figured, okay, so it's poetry. How do we make poetry interesting and dynamic for an audience where it's not just people standing and reciting poetry? So we have to add movement. We have to add music. We have to add atmosphere. And so... Reading through the collection of poetry, I, I found three themes, and they are love, music, revolution, right? And specifically, um, with the music, I thought about jazz and blues. And so for the performance, we're calling it Still Standing, Love, Blues, Revolution. And so we sort of created three settings for the delivery of the poems. We created, um, Mr. Pintard has performed this as a one-man show um, on several occasions. And so what I, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to make it a little bit more dynamic. And so we created five character types. We have three men, unnamed, man one, man two, man three. And we have two women, woman one and woman two. Uh, Dominic plays man three, right? And so the, each of these characters, the two women, the two, the three men sort of represent a type. And so we had to figure out how we, um, the sort of poems that each type, each archetype, um, what would they say? What speaks to this particular archetype? And so that's how we sort of figured out who would deliver which poem or which part of the poem and how these different archetypes um, interacting with each other will work in order to provide a very a loose narrative that the audience can follow again through the ideas of love, blues, and revolution. So enter Dominic, because you're one of the characters. What What is your inspiration? What are you drawing on? If, if, I'm, if I'm to say, to say to find inspiration in my character, Man 3, I was given the archetype, the artist, so when I looked at the various poems that I was, that man three was supposed to deliver, I saw almost, I saw a more modern rendition of an artist, not the traditional artist that you, that you may have seen in the 90s or the 80s or earlier, more something more modern, as I, as I said before. So... I, he's, he's, the majority of his lines are in the love act. So I feel he's very emotionally conscious. So I try to deliver that as best as I can through my performance, as, as well as I feel he's very in touch with everybody else who's on stage and his environment as well. So when I was trying to figure out how I'm going to portray this character, I, I looked at stuff like that and how my body movement might portray something more laid back and more a more chill vibe to say but yeah that's really good i'm curious dominic do dominic do a lot of your friends like or participate in or work in bahamian theater um no i am actually one of the only one of the only friends that i know that actively participate in in bahamian theater other other than the friends that i've made 
at UB in the UB Theater Company or in Short Tales itself. Um, I'd say I was the catalyst because it, it was after I started, everyone was like, oh, how can I get into it? You know, but I, I think everybody just needs that spark because as I said before, a lot of people just don't really know how to get into it. And so when they see one of their peers get into it, it's like, oh, if they can do it, I can do it. And so I always encourage my friends if they're interested in even just getting behind the scenes and getting your hands dirty and working with the backstage crew, they're always welcome. And they, they can always come out and support me or just, just come out and even audition, just read, and then just say you want to volunteer your services. You know, it's, I feel like the Shakespeare in Paradise Association is a really big family. And I'm really grateful to be blessed to be around all of these people all the time. You know, even even though we might have our disagreements sometimes, but I, I it's on it's honestly one of the highlights of my year to be with these people. So yeah. Well, it's certainly refreshing um, listening to to how excited you are about it. Let's take that a step further. If you can give one suggestion for how to increase participation, engagement, support for Bahamian theater, for performing arts in the Bahamas, what would that be? What would your recommendation be? It would be, um, I'd, I'd take a more social media forward route okay, because as you know, in the modern age, us young, us young people, um, we love social media. And so I, I usually keep up with the national, the national theater in the United Kingdom. And they have a TikTok page, they have this, they have this, and they're always promoting. And even though we do it, it's almost at like a smaller stick scale, I should say. So if we can find a way to incorporate it a little bit more or utilize it more effectively, I think we can have re something really, really big on our hands. But um, it sounds like you're talking yourself into a job, Dominic. <laughs> I'd love one. I'd love okay, one. Okay, let's let's talk. Um, yeah. So I would agree with Dominic. He's totally on the on the money. It's very. It's you know, social media is uh rapidly changing ground. When you've been around, Shakespeare and Fridays has now been around for fifteen years, right? So we were doing good back in like two thousand and nine and twenty ten when we had our Twitter page and our Facebook page. We were pretty good on that. And then Instagram started to get big and it was like, oh, we got to do Instagram as well. And now it's TikTok and it's kind of like, well, we have Facebook, right? So we need that. We definitely need that um, push. And so I'm really happy to hear that passion, Dominic. And as I said, you might be, we might just tell you, go right ahead and jump on in and, and do it. Do what you think we need to have done. Um, because we're at a place in Shakespeare and Paradise where, as Craig says, it's a kind of a lunatic space, like where, where it's a little nuts, but it's also really good because we're 15 years old. We are celebrating the year of our 50th, our golden anniversary with a year of Bahamian theater. And we don't have, we don't have any employees. Everybody's a volunteer in Shakespeare and Paradise. Everybody is giving their time. Um, we can't pay people because we don't have enough support. In other places in the world where you can actually have a theater industry, there's investment on all levels, from the government down to the private purse. But we are, we're just keeping our heads above water because we know that this is something that, even though Bahamians don't know they need it, that we need as a country, we need theater and we need our theater to thrive because it is so strong. There was a period of time in the 1980s where Rex Nettleford, and people may or may not know who he was, but he was a great cultural and thought leader out of Jamaica in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Rex Nettleford identified Bahamian theater as the strongest in the English-speaking Caribbean and the most vibrant and the most original. And I have had the opportunity to feel something similar when I've been in contact with other Caribbean colleagues. Um, I remember back in 1992, I was writing, I don't even know what it was that I was writing. Uh, let me say, I was writing the, the book and the script of a musical. Nobody's ever written the music, so I don't know what to call it, in commemoration of um, 
quincentennial. And when I showed it to a Jamaican colleague, he was like, wow, nobody in, nobody in Jamaica is doing anything like this. And I just thought it was kind of normal. So that gives people the idea of what the foundation, what foundation has been laid in Bahamian theater. And my personal goal is I don't want that foundation to not be built on. So that's why we started Short Tales. We want a new generation of great Bahamian writers. And we have some great Bahamian writers. Francis and Hepburn, who did um, First Comes Morning, are two of them. But we have some really interesting other voices. And probably the one I want to shout out right now is Stephen Hanna, who is also known as Xin Yin, and who is also known as a, a filmmaker, as a playwright. He's remarkable. And the other person I'm going to shout out. Uh, sorry, Nico, just yeah. to interrupt. And he is a UB grad. And he is uh, a School UB of grad. English. He is. He's a COB graduate. Or did he graduate under UB? Uh, I think just before. Just yeah. before UB. Yeah. Engl but, yes, from, absolutely. From School English studies. English. Yeah. And he does some amazing stuff. And then he has a colleague, same, more or less generation. I not sure that he finished his senior thesis, but he's still School of English. Travis Cartwright Carroll, also a really interesting playwright, who, if he's listening, needs to write another play. Um, but yes, and that's why we do Short Tales. Short Tales is an incubator for new Bahamian voices, for new Bahamian directors. And I want to take the opportunity to say that I was just looking at the directors who we have in this year of Bahamian theater. And so many of them are, I, I Craig, would I, could I call y'all alum? Um, came through Short Tales, right? So Craig is like the senior out of all of these, but we also have Renee Caesar and Dorian McKenzie. We also have Valleen Roll, Jason Evans, Felicia Roll. All of them have come out of the Short Tales company on one level or another, and they're all directing in this year of Bahamian theater, as well as more established directors like Philip Burroughs, David Burroughs, myself, Skibo Roberts, and then Marcel Sherman, who's been working with Bahamian theater for years, but only just made the transition into directing in the last five years. All remarkable talents. All of the people you called are remarkable talents, and we are we are even glad to claim um, quite a number of them as UP grads. Yep. And and so we're having a really um, enlightening discussion about Bahamian theater, a year of Bahamian theater in honor of the 50th anniversary of of Bahamian independence. This is a good time to take our break. We'll be back with more on University Drive after this. Chapter One Bookstore is your back-to-school headquarters. We are proud to serve the students, faculty, and staff of the University of the Bahamas and the community at large. We are the premier choice for the purchase of university textbooks and supplies and UB logo apparel, paraphernalia, and gifts. We also carry a wide variety of school supplies, learning aids, and leisure books. Visit our coffee center throughout the semester for all of your printing, copying, and binding needs. Chapter One Bookstore is located on the ground floor of the Michael Elden Complex. Call us at 397-2650 or email us at chapter1 at ub.edu.bs. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chapter One Bookstore. See you soon! Welcome back to University Drive. Our guests are Nicolette Bethel, Craig Smith, and also Dominic Stubbs. And they're all involved in a year of Bahamian theater in honor of the 50th anniversary of the independence of the Bahamas. And I have to ask, where should the University of the Bahamas be in terms of sustaining and uh, making Bahamian theater relevant and a thing in the Bahamas, more so. So first of all, let me just say that anybody who knows me will know that University of the Bahamas, this particular place that we are at, has been in my life from the 
very beginning, for, for as long as I can remember, before there was a University of the Bahamas, I my mother was at the government high school, which is why the Keva M. Bethel building is named what it's built, named. Um, but I just want to say that when we started performing Shakespeare back in 2001, before Shakespeare in Paradise was a thing, the, the, the parent company of Shakespeare in Paradise, Ring Play Productions, did its first play ever um, in the College of the Bahamas Auditorium, as it was then. And it was a wonderful performing space. People didn't necessarily see it as such, and it wasn't fancy, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't comfortable like it is now, but it was great for us, the performers, because what we did was instead of performing on the stage, we turned the whole thing sideways. We built our stage up against a wall. We created scaffolding. We had a really narrow stage. We did Macbeth, which was on the syllabus at that time. Um, UB Physical Plant actually built risers for us to put seats on. And we had our backstage behind the audience. So the audience was completely surrounded by the performers. And it was an amazing experience. And we did it as part of Color of Harmony back in 2001. Um, but something seems to happen, not just in the Bahamas, throughout the Caribbean, when we start to upgrade our theater spaces. A lot of times, the people who, are, who have the lead in that upgrading process don't know anything about theater. And I'm afraid that's kind of what happened with the Performing Arts Center. It's the same thing that happened with the center, the, the thing that is called the National Center for the Performing Arts, which was not even being upgraded from a theater, but from a cinema. And so there are very unique and particular um, challenges in that space. But it also happened, just to make us Bahamians feel good, in Trinidad in the Queens Park, or um, the Queens Park Theater there as well. So that's one of the things that we have to be really careful about when we're talking about theater upgrading and so on, is that a lot of times people will invest a lot of money into the upgrading of spaces, but not really know where that money needs to be spent. So there are some, the, 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 the PAC at, at UB is better in many, many, many ways than the Center for the Performing Arts, but there were also some missteps. There were some errors made. For example, the lighting system in there is entirely inadequate for any theatrical performance. And the sound system is also not great. And um, some of the management decisions and the management policies and who makes the final decisions for that theater are also not what they should be. The that theater should be run and controlled by a theater department where experts get to make the final decisions, get to set the pricing, get to run the rentals, get to do all of that, because that's how we function at the Dundas. And that's why the Dundas is in New Providence, the only functional theater really at this point in time. We have performed in the PAC since it was um, converted. And many of the people involved in Shakespeare and Paradise, as you know, you're interviewing several of them, are employees, faculty members, students of the University of the Bahamas and have a great investment in the University of the Bahamas and really want to be able to partner. But when we did um, Merchant, which was our adaptation of Merchant of Venice in the pack, Gordon Mills was the director at that time. And he said afterwards, he said, it's not ready. I can't, we're not gonna do another production there because there are too many things that are not right um, for theatrical performances. So it's really, if, if UB, we really wanted UB to be the home of Shakespeare in Paradise when we started. But um, the other thing that seems to happen a lot in the Bahamas is that we have a culture of drawing a line under the performing arts. So when you grow up and you become a man or a woman, you leave childish things behind. And one of the childish things that you leave behind is play acting. So we kept running into a sense, I don't think it was deliberate, of all these serious academics, a sense of, well, we don't really have space for play acting, right? It's not a real thing. You know, it's not, it's not education or finance or, you know, the big degrees. It's just a hobby. 
And that is not what the university or the college at that time really should be placing its focus on. That being said, um, the College of the Bahamas and the University of the Bahamas produced and is still producing many of the leading lights in theater in the country. And I, I shouted out Michael Bintard and Ian Strawn would be in the first set coming all the way down to Stephen Hanna, Travis Cartwright Carroll, and looking like it's going forward to Dominic Stubbs and others. So where do we, what do we need to do? What do we need to focus on? Because there is an appetite, there is a space. Bahamian theater is something that is vitally important to, to us in terms of our identity too. And we haven't quite spoken thoroughly about theater in terms of Bahamian identity, um, but taking it over to you now, Craig Smith, um, because you are the class, you're teaching classes in, is it film? Is it drama? Is it theater? Um, well, we do have some theater classes. We have, I think the minor you discussed was in um, film and theater. And we had decided to split those into so we can focus on film and we can focus on theater. As a matter of fact, we um, that was a minor, but now we're trying to actually, we're in the process of developing a theater program. Um, I worked on that along with Nico and some others. And so there is a move to um, sort of develop uh, the theater program. I think the papers are now being considered and hopefully, so um, in terms of what UB can do, we can pass those papers so we can have a theater major program and then we hire faculty to teach and we upgrade the PAC, right? So we can um, produce better plays there. So in terms of things that can happen, those are some things that can happen. And, you know, there have been discussions in terms of upgrading the pact for a while now. And so I think if we can follow through with that, I think that would be a great step forward. And then um, if the papers pass for the theater program, I think that would be a great step forward. And so in terms of what we have been doing though, um, institutionally, maybe there, there's still work to be done, but in terms of on the ground, you know, as I said, um, Philip Smith and another, another faculty member who was here, he and I started the University Theater Company. And that company grew and, you know, did what it did on a volunteer basis, right? And so we had people like um, Philippa Moss Colley. Um, we had people like um, Addison Sanders from Media. We had people from Physical Plant. When we um, put together our performance in 20, when was that, 2019? Um, and so we encouraged faculty as well, um, uh, made props for us. And so it was a grassroots um, movement to get the UB Theater Company going. And what that proved is that, you know, like um, Dominic, um, said, you know, there is a desire here among our students and even our faculty and our staff who are willing or who were willing at the time to volunteer their time to see that this production goes off, right? And even, of course, we, we, were, we were in the middle of our second production when COVID shut us down. But when we came back um, this semester, uh, last semester, you know, I had people from media who worked with us last, um, the last time with, from media saying, hey, when are we going to do another production? People from Physical Plant saying, hey, um, you know, I'm available if you need me to help build a set. So uh, we have the desire here on, you know, in terms of faculty, staff, and students. And so, and we are going to continue to do that, but we would like um, some more formalized in terms of really creating the program and hiring faculty and legitimizing it in those ways as well, because I think that is important 
in terms of people taking it seriously and understanding that this is not just a hobby. This is, you know, people build careers um, on stage and behind the scenes, right? And I think um, us creating the program may offer some legitimacy to that to some extent, um, and people may begin to take it a little bit more seriously. I don't know. What do you think, Nico? Yeah, oh, I want to say that right now, I think that this is the best time ever in the history of the university in terms of encouraging the performing arts. In the first place, the current dean is very anxious to have this happen, to have the theater programs in place. And Craig was talking about an undergraduate program, but there's also been work being done on master's programs as well. Um, and the other thing that Craig was talking about and mentioned, and I can endorse that going back to 2001, when we were doing Macbeth in the then College of the Bahamas Auditorium, the buy-in again from Physical Plant and the late Vincent Curry was amazing. They just, they went all out. They, you know, I think that the other thing about theater is that Western theater and democracy came out of the same place at the same time. And I say Western theater and democracy because that's the one that's in the books and that's the one that's studied. But also if you look at the democratic principles of the African continent, they're also very closely aligned with theater because theater is, is a hugely collaborative art. And what Craig is talking about is absolutely the case. I can't think of anything else, to be perfectly honest, that brings people from all parts of the university together like that, on one, focusing on one goal, right? Um, and all sharing in the success. And if there's nothing else that theater and, and, and bringing it to life on the university campus can do, it's bringing us all together. So on the note of bringing us all together, let's talk about patronage and, and donors, donors really, who support the development of theater. How is that going? Does there need to be more of an effort, more of a target, more, more strategy in terms of that? Where are we on that? I don't know. I can't. I'm, when I speak, I'm not going to speak for the Performing Arts Center because my focus is the Dundas. I'm currently serving as the uh, the chairman of the board of um, governors of the, of the Dundas Center for the Performing Arts. And the Dundas has been closed since COVID and the lockdown, first by emergency orders, which had us as a prohibited business for 18 months. But then in the wake of that, by the death of the air conditioning system as a result of that closure. Um, I like to tell everybody the air conditioning system in the Dundas is older than the vast majority of Bahamians. And so when we started it up again in August of 2021, after it had been shut down in March of 2020, it was like, oh no, 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 I retired. I'm working for y'all no more. Um, but it's a big deal. So we, from the Dundas side, we have started a fundraising campaign, which has got a lot of traction among our regular supporters. And we've had a lot of people step forward with very modest donations, a very kind of crowdfunding thing. And we've been able to raise about $15,000 just on that with a couple of larger donations. But it's 10, that's 10% 10 of our goal. We need $150,000 to get started. Now, I don't know what the, what the College of the Bahamas Performing Arts Center needs. It probably doesn't need, I don't know. I wouldn't guess that it needs as much of an investment to start because a lot of the bones are there but there are some corrections, some really important corrections that need to be made um, in that space to make it functional for a live theatrical performance. Yeah, uh, I, I meant I meant the community of um, active donors to theater. Is that growing? Do we need to focus on growing that? Oh, we need to focus on growing that. It is it is small. Um, I don't want to I, I don't want to say robust, but it is small and faithful but it is too small to meet the need. Let's put it like that. So we have a lot of faithful supporters and they are passionate, but we don't have enough. And the one big part of the puzzle 
that is missing, and I'm going to call it out because it is our 50th anniversary, is that there is no consistent, reliable, or standard government investment in the Bahamian performing arts other than Jantini. And can I say too, on that note, can I say too, um, outside of the government, I think across the board, um, so definitely in terms of what Nico's saying, but across the board, I think that you know, investment in Bahamian theater across the board, and that means the government, that means the, um, you know, businesses as well, but it also means the Bahamian people, you know, uh, a performance, a Shakespeare in Paradise, uh, any of our performances, the ticket, I think the highest price ticket is maybe $35, um, and that is not a lot. You know, people go to IMAX, um, the IMAX theater um, in the VIP. And I think the charge for that um, before they even get the snacks or anything is already more than what they would pay for a live performance. And I think I just want people to really think about that, because I think oftentimes we have complaints about the space not looking a particular way or the costumes not looking a particular way or even the sets not looking a particular way because people are comparing it to Broadway, right? And what we what we do here is on par. Like I go to, I, I hate when I say this because it sounds so, you know, but I go to Broadway productions all the time, right? Me and, too, yeah. Uh, let's let's all be let's be bougie together, correct? Right. Um, but in terms for it. of the quality of the performance that you see on Broadway, um, I remember when um we did um Sammy Swain a few years ago, and I was blown away. And given the disadvantages we have in terms of funding for sets and costuming and all the bells and whistles, that production was spectacular, right? Um, and so I think oftentimes we're judged because we don't have all the bells and whistles, but we don't have all the bells and whistles because people don't support because we don't have all the bells and whistles. So we see the vicious cycle, right? In terms of if we would get, if people would invest in local theater, and then with those um, investments of buying a ticket, or maybe even buying a ticket and sponsoring an extra few dollars, then we will have the funds in order to beautify the grounds and to make sure the AC works all the time and all those things that people want um, when they buy a ticket, a, a flight and go to New York and pay hotels to go see a show when they could pay a fraction of that or invest a fraction of that locally so that we can develop and be the Broadway of the Caribbean, you know, yeah. and I and, and I say that, but I really mean that I believe that that could happen here with could, the right yeah. investments. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'll just I'll just um, go back to the Shakespeare Theatre Association conference that was here um, at the beginning of the year. These are Shakespeare professionals. And I want to add something to what Craig says after I give this example. These are Shakespeare professionals from all around the world primarily from the United States. And we had representatives, members of this association include places like Stratford, Ontario, which has a major Shakespeare festival, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, um, the Globe Theater in London, Royal Shakespeare Company in, in Britain, as well as many community Shakespeare festivals across the United States and around the world. And they came to see two of our productions. One of them was our Richard III and the other one was um, Music of the Bahamas which was at that time in the middle of its run. And we did a specific night for the Shakespeare Theatre Association um, performers or, or attendees. And what they had to say after that production just blew my mind. Because I know Music of the Bahamas is a good production. It's a tight production. It's one of our good ones. But it's not our best, right? It's, it's just our standard show. And they walked out of there going, this is the best show I've ever seen. This should be on Broadway. This should be in the hotels. This needs to travel. This needs to go on tour. I've never had so much joy in a theater. This is, this is what these people are saying. These international professional people from all around the world. Um, so I have always known, like Craig, I go to Broadway, I go to London. 
because Philip and I are producers of theater, we, I don't even think it's bougie. I think this is our job. We're supposed to see what the world is producing. And we know how good we are. We know what standard we want. We would be not just world-class because we're already, already world-class. Bahamian theater would be top class, would be, a, a, how can I put it? Would be a conduit for new Broadway work and performers. If we could have an industry, if people were not doing this, outside of their nine to five. Craig can tell you because he has been working with Short Tales since its inception. And we are working in the night, our rehearsals for Short Tales, our rehearsals for everything start at six and they run until 10. We don't rehearse people for four hours. That's two shifts, right? So people are rehearsing two hours a day, but after full days. So you can't get the best out of people. They're tired. They're hungry, right? We try to feed them. But normally during the run, we have like snacks and coffee and biscuits and things like that. But that isn't the same as, you know, dinner. Um, if these people were rehearsing the way that the Shakespeare Theater Association people are rehearsing, i.e. that's their nine to five job, they get up in the morning and they go and rehearse in the day for eight hours. I can't even imagine what Bahamian Theater would be doing. Because we're producing world-class theater in our spare time for nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need the investment. Because we want to be able to give people like Dominic and Valicia Roll and Valine Roll and Tide Jardy and all these other people who want to do this as their living and make their livelihood in this area. We can't pay them. And that's because we don't have enough investment to do so. Yeah, it's a clear message. Um, we've said a lot, but hopefully we can continue these conversations in different forums and in different ways. Our time, we're flat out of time, but I will give you about 30 seconds each for some wrap-up comments. Let's start with Dominic. Dominic, what do you, before we go there though, where can one go to find the full schedule of all the plays coming up um, for the rest of the year? That's a good question. So the, the list of plays is on the Shakespeare in Paradise website, but we will be uploading a full schedule with the actual dates of all of the productions um, over the next week. Uh, but you can go to shakespeareinparadise.org to see the lineup of plays and then to return there and to our Facebook page to find out what the specific dates are. Okay, great. Dominic, wrap up comments. What are your hopes for Bahamian Theater and your involvement in that? Um, my hopes for Bahamian Theater is for it to be taken seriously and actually be considered a profession e eventually. Because even though we do this in our spare time, this is world class. This, this is art. And this is a reflection of our culture and a producer of our culture. So I, I believe it's truly important and we should be getting on making it bigger than it already is. Awesome. Thank you. Nicolette? Um, what Dominic said, I don't think I have anything else to say. So thank you for supporting us, Tamika, by giving us this time. And keep buying the tickets, people. I see them coming in through our Eventbrite page. And keep on buying. Thank you. All right. Then Craig Smith. Um, ditto and ditto. Um, uh, you know, come out and see the show um, if th this airs on Saturday. So we have another um, three performances of Still Standing on Thursday, the 26th, Friday, the 27th and Saturday, the 28th, um, 8 p.m. The shows are in Echo at Bahamar. Um, the Echo Gallery. So please come out and support and support the rest of the productions throughout the um, the year. And yeah, I just, um, you know, support Bahamian culture by supporting theater. In supporting theater, you help us to, um, you know, uh, produce um produce culture in a particular kind of way, it helps us to see ourselves. And one of the things that I think is really important, a conversation that's going on now in the 
film world is about representation and how important representation is. And so, you know, with a film like Marvel's Black Panther and, you know, the idea of Black people seeing themselves on screen and why that isn't so, that, why that's so important because they understand that they're, they are seen, their culture is seen, their humanity is seen. And we are doing that here you know, with Bahamian plays reflecting Bahamian culture and Bahamian language and Bahamian folklore and Bahamian music, we are allowing Bahamians to see themselves in their beauty and their, you know, in the ways that they may be ugly as well. But that's also important for us to see and recognize that and say, yes, this is who we are in all aspects of um, who we are. And I think that's a beautiful thing and it's really important and we should be invested in developing that and seeing it grow. And so I would encourage folks to um, reach out to um, Shakespeare in Paradise, um, reach out to support the rejuvenation of the space, the building of the space, um, come out and support Get your groups and your family members to come out and support and, you know, invest by supporting us financially. But just in terms of even if you just reach out um, to the, you know, organization and let us know that you support us in that way. I think that's really important. All right. Great. Good note to end on. Thank you all for joining us and being guests. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. I've been your host, Tamika Lundy, and this is University Drive. See you next time. University Drive is a production of the Office of University Relations and the Communications and Creative Arts Academic Unit at University of the Bahamas. All rights reserved.